When many people hear the term mythology, their minds often turn toward the ancient Greeks or Vikings, or images of Zeus and Odin, respectively. But every age and area of the world has its own myths, including the Middle Ages. What I would like to do now is give a brief summary of the medieval worldview. Contrary to some of the stereotypes being pushed, the medieval man did not believe that the world was flat. The flat earth was more of an aspect of ancient Norse and Greek mythology, though the ancient Greeks did eventually determine that the world was round. The medieval understanding of cosmology stems from a theory put forth by a Greek scientist named Claudius Ptolemy, who lived in the 2nd century AD. Ptolemy theorized that the earth lay at the center of the universe and that it was surrounded by a series of increasingly larger spheres, each sphere contained a different heavenly body, and each rotated around the Earth. The Moon was the closest body to Earth, followed by Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Beyond the orbit of Saturn was the sphere of stars. The spheres themselves were made up of a substance called aether, which was believed to be the fifth element the earthly elements being wind, water, fire, and earth. This view became the official scientific worldview during the time of the Romans and remained so during the Middle Ages on up into the Renaissance. The medieval philosophers expanded upon this view, proposing that a layer of fire surrounded the earth. Furthermore, they posited that God lived beyond the final sphere of stars, which they believed was the ultimate boundary for the physical universe. The realm in which God dwelt beyond the confines of the universe was called Empyreon. A great example of this cosmology in popular literature is the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, and in particular, Paradiso, in which he visits each of the heavenly spheres. In fact, the Catholic Church itself had accepted the Ptolemaic cosmology as canon, and it would later form the basis of the conflict between the Catholic Church and Galileo. Coming to the earth itself, they did indeed believe it was round, as I mentioned earlier, and even attempted to depict it as seen from the heavens on some occasions. There had already been multiple attempts to calculate the diameter of the earth, however, their understanding of geography had improved little since the Roman period. Medieval world maps, or mappi mundi as they were called, typically followed a basic format. Pictured here is a basic world map from Etymology by Isidore of Seville. The central line is the Mediterranean, which separates Europe from Asia. The horizontal line represents bodies of water which separate Asia from the other two continents. That line includes part of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. This map is important because it plainly depicts the template which most of the maps would follow. In fact, you may have seen images similar to this in old depictions of medieval kings. The sphere, with a line going around the middle, and usually one over the top, or the bottom, is a representation of the entire world. And its purpose is to accentuate or exaggerate the dominion of the king. The Mappi Mundi typically has the east up at the top of the page, and Jerusalem placed in the center of the map. The reason for the east-west orientation was because the medieval man believed that the Garden of Eden still existed in this world, but in a position beyond the Far East, though if one could be fortunate enough to travel beyond India, it would still not be possible to step foot in the Garden of Eden because it was surrounded by a wall of fire or some other kind of barrier to keep humans out. Africa was the land of monsters. Aside from the former Roman provinces in the north and Ethiopia, where they happened to know for a fact that humans lived, the unknown lands of Africa, further to the south, are where the monsters lived. Some of the monsters could have been inspired by distorted accounts of actual tribes which existed there, or they might have been inspired by the presence of the great and dark rainforest of which little to nothing was known. The monsters to be found in southern Africa include the Blimia, which are tall giants with no heads, who instead had faces on their torsos. 
the synacocephaly, or dog-headed men, panoti, that is men with incredibly long ears, and scaopodes, men with a single leg and foot. In Africa and elsewhere, there could be found dragons, which occasionally invaded human spaces and were considered to be a legendary menace. The lore of dragons continues to be a source of creative inspiration even in modern times. Now, this video is not intended to be an in-depth and comprehensive lecture, but I would like to go into a little detail on one of the mythical species I find particularly inspirational, that is, the mandragora. The peculiar shape of the mandrake roots caused people to anthropomorphize the plants and to assign them mystical properties. Mandrakes were harvested for alleged medicinal properties, and medieval scholars provided instructions on how to harvest them. Medieval scholars believed that if a mandrake was pulled up from the ground, it would let out a tremendous scream that would result in death or insanity should a human hear it. Therefore, it was recommended that a man should stop his ears before pulling up the mandrake, and the best method to uproot one was to tie a rope to it and fasten the other end to a hungry dog. When all was in place, you were to offer the dog some food, and when he lunged for the food, the mandrake would be abruptly torn up from the ground, and only the dog would suffer any ill effects from the scream. So what happens after the Middle Ages? As knowledge expands, more accurate maps are drawn, and fictitious races and species are pushed toward the updated perimeters. Eventually, we get to a point where mythology and conjecture about other life is pushed into space because the entire world is explored. But that is a topic for another time. Thanks for watching.